yeah, since there was already the question how to how to utilize uh, uh, Jarvis, um, uh, I'm very grateful for that. I think I, or I hope that I can provide an answer to that. Um, so, uh, as uh, Richard already said, um, we uh, this spring we converted an uh, appl application which was previously provided as a, a com server to a Jarvis-based web service and what I want to talk about is uh, I want to give you an overview of the system first and then um, get into the uh, several steps needed for the conversion. So migrating from API Pathway to Dialog, then uh, converting to a Jarvis-based web service and finally um, containerize the application and uh, deploy it as a Docker container. Um, so. At the heart of all of this, there is an application written in Visual Basic 6 together with a Windows Forms user interface. And then in the back, there is a calculating engine written in API plus Win, which, um, yeah, as, as we all know, is, is the real star of the show here. Um, and this calculating engine is provided as a COM server. So uh, just for context, I should maybe at least once mention what this application actually does. So this application, um, um, well, this application belongs to a, a German insurance company. And what it does is there's this um, well, complicated mask flow, which allows you to enter customer data. You hit enter, the application fetches some data from a database and calls the APL and the APL puts out some, um, some actuarial values which are relevant for um, the accounting of uh, pension policies. And um, well, I'll leave it at that. Um, and this may, this com server, this might sound a bit mysterious to you. And since I didn't want to put any Visual Basic code up here, I thought I'll just uh, translate it to dialogue and show you um, how this interface actually looks like. So there is this OLE client, uh, WS Engine, which ships with APL plus Win, and um, it allows you to start an APL plus Win process in the background, and then um, well do some things with it, like uh, executing system commands to load a workspace, and then call functions, and uh, well that's actually really all that happens here. Um, so let's look again at the system. So this is how it looks like, um, and. One thing to note is everything that you see on the right um, runs on the user's local machine. And this is something that the IT department of the customer finds really annoying because they have to uh, put the API plus win workspace in a shared folder and uh, have to manage all of that and then provide the, uh, the exit for the uh, Visual Basic app. So uh, this leads over to the question why they why they wanted to change the system. First of all, um, the support for Visual Basic 6 is running out, or Microsoft is rather vague about it, that, but, um, well, I think they say that it's more or less deprecated. And also this architecture that I just uh, shown to you on the previous slide, this uh, doesn't really fit anymore into the, the, architect, uh, the, the infrastructure of the customer because they, uh, what they do is they host their own container platform and they want to move as many apps as possible towards this container platform and just do everything um, sort of uh, web, web, uh, web browser based to just have a, like a central location where they, they manage all of their uh, applications. So the goal is of course, uh, as I said, to move to a browser based solution and to replace the outdated components. <coughs> and um, then we, we hope to get to, to end up with something that looks like this. So there is now a web app backend which sort of took the place of the, uh, of the old Visual Basic app. And instead of the API plus win uh, com server, there is now an APL web service. The, the database basically stayed where it was. And, um, well, there now the, the front end runs in a web browser. And um, as you see now, you have this, uh, well, clearly separated architecture where uh, 
the back end and the web service run on the, on the, on the container platform and uh, yeah, this is, I guess, way more manageable. Um, okay, so uh, let's, or before I, I go into the several steps of the conversion, one thing that I should also mention up front is um, that we do not actually maintain this application. We just sort of dropped in for the conversion. And this has some um, implications for, uh, for what I'm going to show you. For example, what is, um, what is kind of important is that we do not do too many modifications to the source code because otherwise we hand it back to the, to the actual maintainers and they will just be very confused and, uh, well, get into a lot of trouble potentially. So, um, okay, I'll be, so uh, let's look at the, at the several steps. I'll be very brief on the first one, the migration to um, Dialog, because the, the workspace only consisted of 300 functions, which, and I guess it, well, the application only re used like one third of it, and that's really not a whole lot, and there's also only this one interface, so the, the migration part uh, really wasn't too special, and then yeah, we'll move on to the more interesting stuff, so the conversion to a JavaScript web service, and then finally uh, containerizing the application. Um, so this is the, the one slide I, <laughs> I prepared um, for, the, uh, for the migration, just to show all of you who are not aware of the difference between um, API, API plus win and dialog, um, what are some things you have to do? For example, there's this, dif uh, there's this difference between uh, replicate each in dialog and API plus win. Um, well, if you uh, look at the, at the first line there, you, um, you will probably um, be able to see that this just returns one, two, but in API plus win, this actually returns one, three, which um, I guess stems from the fact that uh, in API plus win, they uh, decided to interpret the uh, replicate as an operator with an array left operand. So if you think about it like this, then uh, well, then the output one three makes perfect sense. But if you're used to um, looking at dialog, then well, you you might find this a bit confusing. Um, then another thing is, of course, you have to replace several system functions and system variables, and uh, there's this thing which I find a bit odd that in API plus win, by default, all left arguments are optional. And, um, well, you also have to ca take care about that. And, uh, well, there are several, several other things to do. So let's move on to the conversion to a JavaScript-based web service. As Brian already said, Javas supports two paradigms, JSON and REST. And one of the first things that we had to do was to decide which paradigm actually to use. Um, and we chose the JSON paradigm because it's very much suitable for these kind of functional endpoints that we had. And it is also, in my opinion, uh, easier to implement. That is, at least if you uh, sort of come in with an APL mindset, I would say. And then another important question with these old applications, I don't know how many of you have, um, or I guess many of you have actually written these, um, but some others might not, might not be aware that uh, with these old applications, there are always a lot of global variables floating around, and you're not always sure what, what the functions actually, actually do to these variables, and you cannot be sure if the application is actually stateless. And... Um, well, this might come with a lot of implications um, uh, and a lot of actual, uh, a lot of additional things you have to consider. But luckily, the application at at our hand here is actually stateless. So, um, well, this makes it a whole lot of easier uh, because we don't have to worry about where we keep the state and also how to keep the state. Um, yeah, this uh, this can get particularly um, difficult if you decide to spawn multiple insta instances of the container and then load balance uh, uh, load balance the application, then um, yeah, you're just better off if the application is already stateless. Um, then there are some modifications that we did to the existing APL code. As Brian already said, um, Jarvis 
provides uh, result returning monadic or dyadic uh, APL functions. And uh, at least with Tradfins, there is uh, this thing that if uh, that Java is actually as a left argument passes the request object itself, while with the WS engine, it is possible to invoke a function dyadically. So this is also something one, uh, one has to take care of. One has to move the argument sort of left to right. <laughs> Um, and uh, yeah, Jarvis handles all of the JSON conversion. And as you might be aware, there, um, there is no one-to-one -one correspondence between JSON data structures and, uh, and APL data structures. So for example, you shouldn't rely uh, on the particular shape of your, of your arguments because JSON does not uh, add a, the rank of your arguments because JSON does not support rank uh, greater than one. It just, uh, I mean, you can use the variant option for quote JSON, and then it will just split everything up into vectors, but yeah. Okay, um, for us this was all um, a little bit less relevant because um, we just uh, inherited the, the structure of the arguments from the API plus win, and there they just um, passed everything as a string uh, separated by semicolons. Um, and this is one of the, uh, one of the things where uh, I would say if you, um, if you have something to say about um, how the actual request payload uh, should look like, then this is maybe something that you want to change because, um, I mean, you have, you have access to this rich toolbox of JSON data structures, and then I guess it's a bit, it's a bit strange to opt for this. But um, on the other hand, if you, want to, if you want to keep anything as is, then well, this, this also works. <coughs> um, then another thing one has to look at is the error handling. Um, of course, you don't have to, to be worried about actually crashing your, your whole web service just because of an untrapped error because Jarvis will handle that for you and um, return them as uh, internal server error with HTTP status code 500. Um, but I guess the best practices for error handling still apply, uh, whatever you believe uh, that is. And another thing to keep in mind is to use quad DMX. It, I guess at least if you if you run Jarvis with if you run Jarvis in thread one and not in thread zero. Uh, so yeah, just, just use quad DMX and, and be safe. Um, okay, and um, so what we had to do is we had to expand around the initial error handling because the customer wanted to keep all of their error messages um, as they were. And we ended up with doing something like this. So uh, we, uh, we trapped all of the errors and then re-signaled them with um, error number 500 to just trigger the old error handling. And with this new error handling, we uh, introduced some, well, basically some logging functionality to log some meta information about the errors, which also wasn't there before. And it's what it is, uh, this is something which I think is particularly important if you containerize the application because, I mean, what probably or most probably won't happen is that your service just goes down or the container just shuts down and then everything is basically lost. So you, so you really need to, to worry about, uh, well, how, to, how do you reconstruct this error then? Um, and this also leads over to logging. Um, so uh, initially I thought, um, we were just going to uh, log to text, and then there's this way of attaching a, vol a volume to a container, which then allows you to just fetch the text file, or to get the text file out of the container, right? And I thought that this might be a good idea, but um, if you start thinking about the implications this has, if you uh, load balance your application and you dynamically uh, spawn new instances of the container as such, um, well, then this can get a bit problematic. And there's a very easy way to handle the logging, I think, which is to just log to standard out. And then the container platform is uh, 
able to collect all of the logs from the containers that are running and um, I'll just provide them for you. And you also don't have to handle any files or so. So um, yeah, this is also a very, very stable solution, I would say. And yeah, something I, I at least wasn't aware of. Um, a configuration there, we, uh, we only did some very minor things as the, the default configuration was already well suited for us. Um, and we specified the configuration parameters in a JSON file and uh, ended up with a configuration um, similar to the following. So um, what you see in the, in the first two lines are this app close function and app init function. These are two hooks provided by Jarvis. So Jarvis allows you to run uh, user-defined functions on certain events, like for instance here when you uh, on the startup and, and on the stop of the, the web service. And we essentially only use them for logging. Um, then you specify the code uh, location. So what Jarvis also does for you is um, you can just um, provide a path to a, to a folder where you store, off your, uh, where you store, all, uh, store um, your application as text files. And then on startup, Jarvis will just load them in for you. So um, yeah, this is also handled by Jarvis, and you um, maybe there are some some uh, some functions that you do not want to expose as, as endpoints. For example, we saw this namespace error handling um, in the in the quad trap definition, and you probably do not want the user to be able to just access these functions as ad, and, and as ad, as endpoints. So um, yeah, we just hide some things and we specify a port that, uh, that Jarvis is to list on. And as I said, for, well, for really everything else, the, the default configuration was, was good enough for, for what we did. Um, and now it's, uh, after, after uh, we went through all of this, we, are, we were actually able to just um, run our application as a Jarvis-based web service, at least on localhost it is. Um, so we can just uh, create a Jarvis instance, type jarvis.run, hand it the configuration file, and um, well, it will just um, start up the service according to the configuration file. <coughs> so the last thing I want to get into is uh, creating a, d a custom Docker image. Um, uh, Dialog actually provides several Docker images uh, uh, on Docker Hub, um, but these are only for experimentation only. So once you get closer to, or you you may want to uh, experiment experiment with them, and once you uh, you sort of get closer to production, you really want to come up with your uh, with your own custom image to. Uh, for, uh, to uh, yeah, prevent things changing under your feet and to really have your, your, uh, your own components there. And um, what we did is to achieve this is uh, we just took the Docker file for the Dialog Jarvis and Dialog Dialog public images and we um, modified them according to our needs. <clears throat> and the key difference is uh, uh, we used a different base image, so essentially a different, uh, different installation of Linux, and uh, we handled the loading of the dependencies a bit different and added some configuration. Um, but overall, our, our custom image really is quite simple because it just consists of the base image, um, the interpreter, uh, the Java source code, and the source code for our application. So this is really all we needed. Okay, and then we'll end up with a Docker file that looks like this. So a Docker file basically specifies the, the building instructions for your custom image. And uh, this is, of course, a simplified version of it, but I don't think I've left any major steps out. I just removed some of the, or a lot of the noise going on. So at the top, you'll see the base image. Um, we use a minimal installation of Red Hat Enterprise Linux. 
then uh, we add all of the components. And one thing that I should point out is, as you see, we just uh, clone the dialog Jarvis repo and uh, well, use that uh, well, one. So this is a really nice way of shooting yourself into the foot if if Brian uh, decides to uh, to add something to Jarvis and then you well it just changes under your feet and and might not work out too well if you do it like this so you should you should really target one of the one of the releases which is there and just uh, move up manually as new releases are coming in then uh, you specify some environment variables um, for the startup so you see we we specify where our config file is and we specify a load parameter for the interpreter. So um, if you look at the GitHub, this, this Java source folder it not only uh, contains the, uh, the source code for the framework, but also a function which does the auto start of the, of the web service. So if you pass this as, um, as a load parameter, um, all of this will uh, get loaded in with uh, using link. And then um, it will automatically uh, execute this function, which is called run, and which then handles all of the startup according to the uh, to the configuration file. And finally, we set uh, we set the dialog as the executable, which which runs at startup. Um, yeah, and oh, wait, I wanted to leave it at that. Um, and yeah, that's that's basically everything that you need to do there. And um, well, uh, I will be also very brief on, on this slide uh, just to sort of, sort of show how, how, um, how, the build and how the build and deploy process looks like. Um, we have a Git repository where we store our, our source code, the Jarvis config, and our Docker file. And then you can trigger a build, uh, build pipeline and on build, you add all of the other components to the image, and then you end up with, the, with your custom image in an image registry. And finally, you trigger another pipeline to promote everything to the container platform. And then, yeah, you are basically already done. Um, there are a, a few points that I completely neglected until now, and I think they are very much beyond the scope of this talk. Um, but these are also like security testing and also maintaining the, the Docker image are, uh, are really things that you need to think about at some point. Okay, um, so that's, uh, that's already all I wanted to say. Um, uh, well, the, the, the uh, app is yet to go into production mainly because the the web app, which you, which you saw on one of the slides, which is the replacement of the Visual Basic app, um, is not yet ready. Um, so the APL web service is, uh, which I guess uh, uh, tells you that, that it's very, well, it's very easy to, to convert, or it's considerably easier to convert an existing application to a Javis Web, uh, web service instead of uh, rewriting a, a Visual Basic 6 app. Um, and um, well, the, the, the web service now already runs on the container platform, and they are uh, the, the guys developing or the, the developers uh, of, the, of the web app, they are already calling it. And I'm always very happy whenever I, I log into the into my account there and I see container running since like two months and no issues at all. Uh, so I can, I can really emphasize what has already been said yesterday. You have all of these wonderful tools and you just drop your code in and well, with only a few minor tweaks, everything just works and yes, really stable and uh, I think this whole conversion process was really enjoyable, and I, I hope I will be able to uh, participate in similar projects very soon. Thank you.